Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je veux commencer avec une euh, euh, reconnaissance du pays. Euh, L'Université de Sydney s'est euh, située euh, dans les terres du peuple Gadigal, dans le pays Eora. Euh, C'est une terre non cédée et je veux faire euh, reconnaissance des euh, chefs et seigneurs Uh, le chef et seigneur uh, au passé, au présent et au futur. Uh, Motu, uh, me want him sing out long all uh, friends, more people, long tafea, where all field workers, more all chief, more elders, only make him say uh, work blow me fella, him possible. Um, more lo, all uh, friends, long Vanuatu Cultural Center, where all is taplo villa, where him too, him make him say, uh, work blow me fella and me savi go ahead. Um, and with apologies for switching to a third language, um, I'm going to present in English, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions en français. And I think hopefully between uh, Matthew and I, we can figure things out. Everyone can hear me okay? Okay. Um, so academic analyses of cannibal tales from the South Pacific have tended to focus on questions of documentary veracity, highlighting the biases and in many cases more or less explicit racism of the European men who dominate the colonial archives. This has been an, an important development in providing balance to historical narratives and rejecting rhetoric that can do harm to living Pacific Islanders. However, there's a danger in assuming that because some stories about cannibalism were exaggerated or fabricated, all narratives about Pacific cannibals must involve lies and racially motivated fear-mongering. Um, this is particularly the case where the cannibal talk comes from islanders themselves and where the stories follow a pattern of what Ballard describes as historicities, that is, those historical narratives that are enacted within island geographies integrating supernatural as much as human explanations of what happened in the past. Southern Vanuatu provides examples of the ways that tales of anthropophagy, a term sometimes preferred by anthropologists and others as carrying less colonial baggage than cannibalism, are grounded in place and material culture. There was certainly extensively extensive colonialist myth-making, not least among the European missionaries who entered the region beginning in the mid-19th century. However, the presence of custom or traditional histories of anthropophagy that relate to both the pre-colonial and colonial periods uh, suggests a long durée of people narrating stories in place that relate to the consumption of human flesh. Southern Vanuatu consists of five inhabited islands, roughly from north to south, Aramango, Tana, Aniwa, Futuna, and Anaichim, with the uninhabited Matthew and Hunter Islands further to the south. The islands were initially settled in the Lapita period, roughly 3,000 years ago, and have been continuously occupied since then. Futuna and Aniwa are classed as Polynesian outliers on the basis of their language, though they also feature close ties to neighboring islands, uh, particularly Tana. One of the key imports from Polynesia roughly 1,000 years ago, along with kava and pigs, was the introduction of new culture heroes to the local pantheon, above all the demigod Mwatitiki, also spelled Mashijiki, or pronounced Mashijiki. Um, we will go back and forth between these pronunciations to correspond with the islands where they make sense. Um, Mwatiktiki is a localized version of the pan-Polynesian supernatural being Maui in the form of Maui Tiki Tiki. Um, as in other parts of the Pacific, Mwatiktiki is credited with fishing islands out of the sea, helping people establish and maintain their lives in the islands and creating different features in the local geography. A particular boulder bears the marks for Mwatiktiki sharpening his ads on Futuna, in Aniwa, he punched an active volcano through the island and into Tana, where it became the still active Mount Yasur. Significantly for this narrative, common tales of Majijiki battling a cannibal monster exist on Tana, Futuna, and Aniwa. In the Aniwa version, a monster called Nafunyoto caught people and kept them inside a fence to fatten them up before they were to be eaten. 
One day, he accidentally caught Majijiki. Majijiki helps people evade the monster by transforming into the core of a breadfruit with the other captives as the seeds and escapes up a tree. Eventually, Nafunyoto is tricked into attempting to climb the tree via a rope, which Machijiki cuts with his magic adze, causing the monster to fall to his death. After Machijiki confirms that Nafunyoto is really dead, he cuts open the monster's guts and brings the bones of the people inside back to life, sending them back to Tana and Aramango, where they originated. On Futuna, Majijiki's opponent is described more generically as the monster, Tapasiesi. In this story, Tapasiesi circulates around each district of the island in a clockwise direction, capturing and eating people, while Majijiki helps people escape via the more auspicious counterclockwise route, saving one boy and one girl from each village. This story is embedded in specific aspects of Futuna's cultural geography. Mashijiki is associated with the district of Pau, while Tapasiesi is said to originate at the edge of the Marai at Kamkaveni. Other landscape features such as prominent viewpoints, canoe landings, and rock outcrops feature throughout the story. The fringing reef along the north of Futuno was created by Mashijiki to provide a barrier to Tapasiesi during a daring escape. Tapasiesi created his own obstacles in the form of jutting cliffs and rock outcrops, subsequently broken by Mashishiki to allow the captives to escape. At one point, Tapasiesi even transforms his anus into a kind of compass, pointing him to the location of the escapees, which has been interpreted as a reflection of the physical form of the island, with the vectors radiating, radiating from the monster's innards, reflecting the wedge-shaped district of the dome-shaped island. Other cannibal folklore exists for Southern Vanuatu. In one tale from Aniwa, two young women are lured into a house by a remarkably handsome young man called Fok Fole after meeting him at a spring at Ipake. Fok Fole binds a door made from a, ro a woven mat with his guts and attempts to devour the women who flee. The women escape with the assistance of their mother, but the mother celebrates too soon, assuming they had passed the village fence at Irawaru when in fact they hadn't. Folk Fole captures, recaptures them and smashes their bodies and eats them. In another story, a monster called Ten Afunoto catches a young man who has accidentally strayed from home after dark while on a fishing trip. Uh, in the encounter, the young man is forced to unwittingly carry the monster home to his grandfather. Uh, the grandfather, recognizing what is happening, poisons Ten Afunoto by putting sea urchin spines and poisonous fish in the water inside of a bamboo container from which the monster drinks. Um, and given the topic of the last uh, presentation, it's worth noting that a lot of these stories were in uh, one of the, the key papers by Jean Guillard about uh, the cultural anthropology of Aniwa Island. Um, these pre-colonial tales of cannibalistic monsters in Southern Vanuatu tend to have common threads. The act of cannibalism is one of social transgression and individual greed. Particularly in the Mwatiktiki stories, the monster's insatiable appetite can be read as an allegory for powerful individuals who take too much for themselves and destroy the ecological and social order in the process. The stories are also narratives of place, with people being able to point to specific features in the landscape that were part of the story or even created by its protagonists. They feature clear references to local material culture, as in the examples of Fokpole's mat or the bamboo water container used by the hapless youth's grandfather to poison Ten Afunoto. There is also evidence of what might be described as justifiable or at least socially sanctioned cannibalism attendant upon war and conflict between groups. Um, when this is described in oral traditions, the victims are usually those killed in war or ambush attacks. A common feature in such tales is that parts of the corpse are distributed among various allied communities. It thus forms a means of cementing relationships, reaffirming alliances. It would seem to be a relatively rare occurrence and one participated in a special rite as well as a special ceremony. For instance, Giach, and we again heard about this in the last presentation, but we'll expand a little bit more records that in each tribal group on Tana, there would not be more than a single lineage that had the right to partake in anthropophagy. 
He even provides a Tana-wide listing of such lineages, totaling only 38 families or named individuals with the right to consume human flesh across 12 districts out of about 120 in the island. These instances occur within a much larger listing of other attributes of secular prestige, uh, totaling some 141 pages of text. Um, in the main text, he claims that on the entire island that there had never been more than 28 separate lineages with the right to eat human flesh, although that might be a typo for 38. Guiar notes that a killed enemy's body, male or female, would follow ceremonial roads linking allied communities, slung like a pig beneath a pole and carried by his killers to its first stop. At this village, the cadaver would be hung by its feet from a sacred tree overnight, and the porters rewarded with kava and a high-status hairless pig. This village then carried the corpse uh, to the next destination, receiving in turn kava and a glabrous pig for their trouble, and so on from community to community to community until it was ready to be eaten, which was when very clear signs of decay could be observed and a lineage with the right to consume human flesh decided to cook the body. The decision was not taken lightly as it obligated that lineage to provide a substitute enemy body at some time in the future, which would travel in the opposite direction along the ceremonial road back to the village of the original killers. Interested men and women of the lineage would then eat the body at de a designated place away from the community with the skull hidden within a banyan tree. By the time of Guiar's research after the Second World War, this was memory culture, but such practices can be confirmed in general terms for other Tafaya islands from earlier written accounts and island-specific oral traditions. Cannibalism of enemies did occur, but it was generally rare and involved, uh, in, and involved in affirming friendly relationships with particular groups on the island. Only particular lineages that had received the right to consume human flesh could partake, or in some cases, it was only those said to be of chiefly status who could do so. Humphreys notes that for, can for Tana, uh, cannibalism was at all times a ceremonial rite in connection with warfare, whereby the chiefs of the conquering tribes thought to receive strength and prowess from the physical consumption of part of the captured enemy's body by a sort of contagious magic. Reading against the grain of missionary writings from other islands reveals a comparable set of practices. Thus, in missionary John Getty's diary from Anitium, we read of the deadly ambush of a Christian man called YY in December 1851. This was undertaken to cement an alliance between two districts, with parts of the body being sent to further districts on the island to be consumed by specific individuals with the right to eat human flesh. When Europeans entered the scene, a different sort of fearful tale was developed. Europeans were obsessed with the concept of Melanesian cannibalism and created all kinds of stories to describe feasts of human flesh to their audiences. At the same time, Melanesian people themselves constructed a culturally mediated narrative about the outsiders from the first moments of contact. When Cook landed at Port Resolution in 1774, he and his landing party were met with an offering of yams and coconuts bounded by a fence of wild cane following the form of offering that would be given to propitiate dangerous ancestral spirits, or Yerma. When the London Missionary Society George Turner arrived in Port Resolution in 1842, he was told that a local sorcerer, or Tupunas, who had been killed by a British sailor during the 1774 encounter, was actually the target of a rival Tupunas who had drawn Cook to Tana with his magic. The European interlopers had been entrapped in supernatural conflicts that were beyond their imagining. The Cannibal Act that would forever cement the reputation of Southern Vanuatu and specifically Aramango in European imaginations was the murder and apparent ritual consumption of London Missionary Society missionary John Williams, who was killed at Dillon's Bay along with his secretary James Harris on the 30th of November, 1839. The pair were killed on the beach and Williams' body is remembered as being brought inland where it was eventually divided among the district chiefs uh, or fanlo to be in, cooked and eaten. The stone where Williams was laid out features pecked cupules measuring his height and how far his arms stretched, and people remember the stone from which portions of the body were handed out to be taken to the different districts. From 1839 onwards, Aramongo is cast as a martyr isle, where Europeans, especially missionaries and their families, were under constant threat of being murdered and eaten. A similar attitude was expressed about people in southern Vanuatu generally, including in the early missionary encounters on Tana and Anaitium. In Aramango, the Presbyterian missionaries to follow Williams included brothers George Gordon, active 1859 to 1861, and James Gordon, active 1868 to 1872, 
both of whom were killed while proselytizing. Each of these stories is also memorialized in place on Aramongo from the stone high on a mountain overlooking Dylan's Bay that bears George's bloody footprint, uh, an apparent gospel reference, to the cursed tree where the murderer Nirim Pau hung after killing James Gordon at Potnuma. On Tana, missionaries were not killed, but rather chased from the island. However, they had no doubts about what would occur if the islanders were successful in capturing them. For the islanders' part, there was a clear logic to why missionaries were killed or exiled in southern Vanuatu. The missionaries' behavior and their attitudes caused them to be labeled as dangerous sorcerers, responsible for visiting all kinds of disasters on the islands, from outbreaks of measles or influenza to destructive cyclones. The missionaries function much as the magic wielding Tupunes of Tana or Tavua of Aramongo, but because the foreigners were so unpredictable, at some point they could no longer be tolerated. After being chased from Tana in 1862, John G. Payton would resettle some years later on Aniwa. The local chiefs had Payton settle on dangerous ground belonging to the sea snake god Tagaro, hoping he would fail and depart as previous Anaitimi's teachers had. In establishing the mission space, Peyton cleared several mounds containing bone, which he characterized as the remains of cannibal feasts that had taken place in the islands he then passed. Uh, and given uh, Frederick Valentin's presentation yesterday, you can imagine that identification should be highly suspect. As can be seen in the historical European accounts, Melanesian people were used as props in tales of the savage islanders who killed and ate their enemies in the dark bush. On the other side, Melanesians likewise fit European invaders into their own cosmologies, recognizing the inherent spiritual dangers of dealing with the agents of a new and wrathful god. As a coda to this period of colonial encounter, Peyton was responsible for arranging the British Navy to bombard Tana and burn several villages in 1863. This event, known as the Kurosawa Affair after the ship involved, clearly demonstrates that missionaries were capable of unpredictable, violent, and irrational acts as the villages bombarded had nothing to do with the people who chased Peyton off the island. Living island Melanesians can have an uncomfortable relationship with narratives about anthropophagy. Uh, living island Melanesians can have an uncomfortable relationship with the narratives about anthropophagy. On the one hand, as noted above, a historical overemphasis on cannibal tales in the South Pacific has created a damaging stereotype that deserves to be marginalized in islander histories. Uh, on the other, the titillation of encounters with the ancestors of the last cannibals provides an attractive narrative for tourists seeking an authentic experience of an exotic past. Uh, in Aramongo in particular, there's a belief that the history of missionary deaths on the island has cursed the people, even as they almost universally converted to Christianity after the 1880s. A reconciliation ceremony with descendants of John Williams in 2009 was meant to lift the curse. Needless to say, uh, the Peyton family, nor the British Navy, has offered to reconcile with the people whose ancestors were murdered during the Curacao affair. Oh, skip ahead to start wrapping things up. The clearest example of manipulation of tourist expectations in southern Vanuatu comes from so-called Mystery Island, or Inuk, a small coral key to the south of the main settlement of Anelkawat. Mystery Island features both the airstrip for Anaitium and a beach where tourists from massive cruise ships are fared to a local market. In addition to the pleasures of fresh grilled seafood uh, and refreshing coconuts, tourists can pose in a concrete basin uh, overlooked by a garish sign advertising Mystery Island cannibal soup. The pot itself, however, is not a form of any local vessel from any period of time in Vanuatu's indigenous past. Rather, it's a skeuomorph of a cast iron tripod used by the Euro-American whalers who were active in the arid area during the 19th century. Uh, again, whose savagery is demonstrated by this form of material culture could be debated, debated given the viciousness and long-term environmental harm caused by the Pacific whaling industry. Nonetheless, the image of tied up Europeans floating in cannibal pots has become a widespread trope. Uh, from the tripod on Inug, the imagery has been transformed, transferred to any number of tourist media, including postcards, uh, t-shirts, and tea towels for people looking to add a particular twist to their culinary assemblage. And this is my last slide, so I'm almost done. Uh, tales of cannibalism in the South Seas can be subject to an endless array of deconstruction and discrediting. A critical lens is certainly called for when reading an archive that is inherently biased and reliant on racial stereotypes for its narrative. At the same time, the stories from both pre-colonial and colonial eras 
that are embedded in place suggest some of these narratives deserve attention in construction of Islander histories. In an evolving post-independence and post-colonial environment, indigenous ni Vanuatu are having to articulate different forms of local identities and traditions, usually leveraged by the Melanesian pidgin term custom. Many ni Vanuatu are quite self-consciously aware of their own histories and how they can be interpreted and how they can be performed for different kinds of outsiders from academic scholars to tourist visitors. The grounding of these performances in place is another way that anthropophagic narratives continue to be articulated through a local lens as people manage the ways that local historicities emerge in present landscapes. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions about uh, Caroline's uh, talk or about uh, James' uh, talks. So you can reach your hand if you if anybody has any question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hello, James. I just wanted to know if, um, well, I, I, first of all, um, congratulations for your great speech. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I just wanted to know if, um, uh, well, it seems clear that um, cannibalism is uh, related to to um, capitalism and yet uh, there is uh, something which is a bit a bit um, close to exotism so do you think that it's uh, related to exotism as well as it was um, uh, related to tahitian um, poet uh, i don't remember the name but uh, i will find it somewhere and uh, well it's not uh, a, a, a real Tahitian, but he was in love with Tahiti. And we don't really speak about uh, cannibalism in Tahiti, but um, as there are uh, people over there are uh, depicted as very friendly. And uh, in Marquesian Island, it's uh, totally the reverse. They look um, like real cannibalists, <laughs> and there are still uh, some. Um, some, uh, well, don't, I'm trying to find my words, so it's a bit difficult, it's not my first language. So, yeah, uh, they say that uh, there are some hences, uh, some tunes of cannibalism uh, still um, uh, of nowadays, you know, still on in nowadays. What do you think about that? So, yeah, I mean, in terms of the exoticism thing, one of the things that's really interesting about um, Tana Island in particular is, uh, and I still haven't figured out a, a good place to publish it, but maybe I should send something to the Journal de la Société des Océanistes. There's a French manuscript that's in the State Library of New South Wales that is based on the writings of Cook in his diaries about, you know, coming to Tana in 1774. And the imagery is very similar to what you were describing about Tahiti. He talks about how friendly the people are and how kind of well-formed they look. And, um, and, and you know, the, the, there's actually illustrations in the back of a, a Tani's man and a Tani's woman. And they, they're kind of bluish color and they have these interesting tattoos and kind of interesting clubs that look like you know illustrations of that period of sort of Celts um, and then in the 19th century when the first missionaries start arriving in the region that narrative is really transformed to one of you know how savage people are and how ugly they are and how kind of debased and and um, and cruel their their society is. Um, and so I think there's there's actually kind of transformations of transformations happening in these in these historical rhetoric. Um, and and then I think that 
kind of ends up continuing uh, into the present day. Um, you know, in terms of of uh, uh, cannibal tunes, as you say, or maybe tales um, in the present, uh, you know, I, I think it's what's interesting is the way that people will um, kind of uh, manage or or manipulate that rhetoric to suit suit their own kind of social yeah. and political purposes and positions. So you think they they disguise uh, historical events? Uh, I wouldn't say they disguise it, but I think they they uh, you know they're like I said, people are very kind of aware of of what they're doing when they're telling these stories. So one one of the things that people will often articulate in Vanuatu in terms of custom and in terms of how they kind of uh, articulate kind of custom or tradition with, with Christianity particularly, um, is they'll often say, ah, custom hemi should come back, be, uh, you know, need blo put him all recipe, recipe blo cook him man. So, you know, um, we're very interested in reviving our traditions, but we'll maybe leave the the recipes for cooking people and eating people back in the past where they belong. And that's that's a very kind of common um, uh, sort of way of of describing things. Um, I actually had a really interesting encounter once where, as we were excavating uh, George Gordon's house up on a cliff above Dillon's Bay in Aramango, um, it was right around lunchtime, and at the time. Um, my wife was living in the U.S. and she would call around lunchtime as she was going to bed to say hello. And um, Jerry Taki, the the late great field worker from Aramongo, I was busy finishing up a drawing or something. Is going to take like two more minutes. I said to Jerry when the phone started ringing, "Oh, by you got him." So he picked up the phone and he said, "Hey, James, Mrs. Blow, you stop call blow t- blow." St- so look say me fali bin kakayu one him which was you know your wife is calling to find out if we've eaten you or not um so you know i mean jerry was a was a a, a big personality and and kind of a, a bit of a, a a character um but people will use that sort of rhetoric um for for all kinds of reasons right to to amuse tourists to joke with their friends um, and and to express sometimes very sincere truths about what they they see as the kind of priorities for their their culture. Uh, uh, Marlise, vous vouliez compléter la question ou on, on passe la parole? Oui, oui, à... en fait, j'ai, j'ai juste encore un petit truc à, à demander à uh, James, if uh, you agree to answer. Um, I found that there was uh, some correlation between uh, uh, the Christianism and cannibalism. Like uh, they share the body of the Christ when when they do the ceremony uh, for um, Catholic practices. Do mm. you agree that uh, it it might be uh, um, some well correlated? I- I mean, I, I think that's probably a whole other, like, 20 minute paper, right? It's especially if we started to interrogate the differences mm-hmm. between the the kind of Catholic notion of transubstantiation, which is that you're eating the actual body of of Christ, and the the kind of Protestant uh, version of the story, which is that it's a symbolic consumption, and and you know, so so how people's understanding, depending on if they're in a place that was missionized by Catholics or Protestants. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a really interesting potential um, narrative that could be could be built around that. But I feel like I've already said too much, so I, I might see if there's other questions for, for some of the other speakers this morning. Thank you, James. Uh, Yann, question de Michael? Cor, Cor, Michael, Michael, j'appelle, euh, bonsoir, bon, bon, ah, on est midi là, on, on a tâté. et juste pour répondre, uh, I speak English better, you know, what, what do you prefer? Uh, it's a, doesn't matter. It's, a, it's, right? a, it's, just, it's just, a, just a comment on this question about the Marquis and Islands, 
you know, mm. where I I work, and um, they use I just just for um, Marilise. Aujourd'hui, c'est utiliser cette image de cannibale, féroce cannibale, qui était bien sûr une, une image bien construite uh, dans tous les domaines de tourisme. That means all the in the tourism industry, this image of the Marquis warrior, invented mm. image of the Marquis warrior, and the invented image of the Marquis cannibal. I think uh, you have a paper of, uh, of a colleague here uh, who will talk about this killing of this German fellow uh, recently in 2011. And so, so the whole uh, subject is floating around and it's used, like you said, in a very smart way, talking to foreigners about the dangers of these islands. Yeah. Yeah. That's all what I want to say. Yeah, I mean, but there is no there is no recent story about cannibalism. The la late the latest guy killed and maybe have eaten was in 1888 in Cuomo. Mm -hmm. And it's not even sure that he was eaten because that's by missionary report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um. we have a bad connection, I think. Yeah, sorry. It's, I know it's. I don't want to be the only one to ask questions. Uh, so maybe. Um, uh, um, well, I was just thinking about something because when I used to live in Marquesan Island, people told me that uh, there were some tourists uh, that disappeared in a very strange way. You know. <laughs> and it was just uh, giving some credit to the um, to the cannibalism still uh, um, going on there, but I'm I'm sure that it it has not any uh, real uh, basis, and it's just a um, mythical. Um, uh, yeah, well, it's just to to frighten people, you know not to go to places which are forbidden, which are tapu. Mm. That's it. And thank you for the answer. Uh, I don't remember the name who okay. the person just before. Okay. Uh, just, uh, I, I can just uh, re um, respond immediately to Marilise because I was directly involved in the whole murder case in Lukuhiba. I was the translator of the victim of the of the wife of the victim, and I know all the action, what happened around it, every detail. You know, I was involved in the whole um, whole thing. It took one one year before the process, and of course there was a lot of talk. But I think Veronique Lacarde, she will uh, talk about this anyway. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions ou d'autres interventions avant euh, une courte pause J'avais quand même une petite question pour Caroline, hein, s'il n'y euh, si a pas d'intervention extérieure. Miss Caroline, je voulais savoir euh, comment euh, Jean Guillard il a déconstruit le discours sur le cannibalisme. Est-ce qu'il s'est attaqué en fait, aux, aux sources, aux récits, et il a essayé de déconstruire les récits en eux-mêmes, les multiples de récits de cannibalisme supposés en Nouvelle-Calédonie ou est-ce que c'est une sorte de contre-discours, mais qui s'en est tenu là, finalement Ça a été euh, chercher euh, les, les sources de ces récits. Alors, la, la théorie de Guillard euh, vient corroborer, en fait, ce qu'il a dit le plus souvent à propos de, de toutes les, tous les chercheurs qui lui ont succédé, qui était, euh, vous ne devez pas euh, interviewer un seul une seule personne ressource, vous ne devez pas avoir simplement le récit ou le témoignage d'une seule personne, parce que cette personne peut vous raconter n'importe quoi qui va arranger effectivement son, sa position et, euh, et vous instrumentaliser. Euh, donc le principal reproche, c'est de dire, vous ne, vous ne croisez pas assez les sources, vous n'avez pas, euh, euh, pas d'inventaire sociologique vraiment complet comme moi je les ai fait, ou euh, vous êtes à la merci de ces récits euh, transformés euh, qu'on vous, euh, qu vous euh, sert. Et, et c'est là-dessus aussi qu'il va, euh, qu va parler du cannibalisme en disant bah « Oui, on vous, a, on vous a raconté ça, vous n'avez fait aucune vérification. » C'est plutôt une carence méthodologique. Il a toujours dit que les autres chercheurs étaient euh, naïfs, incompétents, euh, dilettantes. Enfin, il euh, y a toute la panoplie des, euh, 
des adjectifs pour, pour caractériser ouais. des gens qui, selon lui, n'ont pas assez euh, travaillé. Euh, Lénart l'avait très bien fait. Lui, il avait fait du mieux possible en complétant les travaux de Lénart. Et puis, dès lors qu'on arrive après, eh ben, on, on, on pêche forcément par, euh, par manque de méthode. Voilà. C'était plutôt, euh, plutôt dans cette idée-là. Euh, à part quelques personnes euh, qui ont tourné grâce à ses yeux, mais il y en a bien peu. Mais sinon, il a, il a plutôt déconstruit chaque ouvrage, chaque article de chaque chercheur en expliquant de toute façon ça, euh, vous n'avez pas assez bossé, donc forcément, euh, ce n'est pas fondé. Voilà. D'accord. Merci, Jérémy. Oui, il y a une question de Patrice, Patrice Baudin. Oui, bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, je voudrais juste un tout petit témoignage. Il se trouve que j'ai été l'élève de Guillard de 72 à 82 avant d'arriver en Nouvelle-Calédonie. Et qu'au début des années 70, Guillard parle encore de cannibalisme. Pourtant, ses enquêtes à, à, au Vanuatu euh, ont, ont disparu. Il va en parler comme si c'était une pratique assez courante. Et puis, petit à petit, on va le, le voir évoluer et imaginer que le cannibalisme, je me souviens d'un cours, c'est doit être en 1974, où euh, il dit bah, on dépeçait les cadavres. Euh, on les mettait dans des paniers et on distribuait ça aux alliés, mais en fait, euh, on ne mangeait pas. On distribuait le cadavre, mais on ne le mangeait pas. Et puis, petit à petit, il va arriver à cette position, qui est celle que Caroline a bien expliquée, en disant le cannibalisme n'existe pas, c'est une invention. Euh, donc, il faut croire que pendant très très longtemps, lui-même n'avait pas vérifié toutes ces informations et par coupé, puisqu'il imaginait que... Euh, les autres euh, parlaient de cannibalisme uniquement par euh, euh, défaut de, de méthodologie. On peut se poser la question de savoir à partir de quel moment il a pris conscience réellement, puisqu'il n'était plus sur le terrain, de, de ce défaut de méthodologie, y compris chez lui. Euh, donc là, il y a vraiment une, une question pour moi assez complexe à comprendre comment euh, Guillard, qui euh, a parlé pendant très longtemps, tant qu'il était, je dirais, encore très en lien avec le terrain de cannibalisme, et pourquoi, à un moment donné, euh, ça a viré Alors, j'ai une, une proposition dont on pourra reparler, si vous voulez, c'est que il y a, y a aujourd'hui un vrai problème avec le cannibalisme, qui est que, grosso modo, on a deux positions qui s'affrontent. Celles qui font de l'anthropophagie une sorte de, de culture alimentaire, euh, en admettant que, pour différentes raisons qui sont euh, souvent expliquées à partir de schémas euh, évolutionnistes ou, euh, ou de schémas psychologiques, etc., le cannibalisme était une sorte de coutume alimentaire, les gens mangeaient les choses. Et puis, il y a ceux qui refusent obstinément de dire bah « non, le cannibalisme n'existait pas ». Et alors, le résultat, c'est que derrière ces, ces deux positions, en fait, elles sont symétriques et elles ont un point commun, c'est nous empêcher de comprendre éventuellement les pratiques qui ont pu être à un moment donné taxées de, de cannibalisme, parce que les deux, que ce soit celle du refus ou de l'autre, vont toutes les deux ranger euh, le cannibalisme dans la sauvagerie, l'animalité, euh, euh, l'horreur, en essayant justement de, de, de finalement, euh, ton combattant, d'éviter de, de, de parler de la vraie chose qui est le cannibalisme, c'est-à-dire les pratiques qui ont pu éventuellement exister, parce que les gens témoignent, mais ils témoignent pas que pour dire des, des choses qui font plaisir aux Européens. Il y a dans le Pacifique, pensez aux travaux de Salines, etc., puis Françoise parlera de ce qu'elle a fait à Fidji, moi, de ce que j'ai eu, et puis il y a Alban Belsa, etc., où les gens parlent de cannibalisme. Alors, bien entendu, ça ne correspond pas à l'image qu'en ont ni les, les détracteurs du, euh, du, du cannibalisme, ni ceux qui euh, pensent que le cannibalisme était une chose euh, absolument habituelle et euh, ordinaire, euh, quasiment alimentaire, mais il faut bien faire quelque chose de ces témoignages. Voilà, c'était juste ce que je voulais dire.